And this is Cal Z coming at you again once more from blogtalkradio.com forward slash Count Z. And uh, Richard, do I have you on the line? Yes, you do. Oh, excellent. We've got a good connection this time. Uh, Richard, how do you pronounce your last name? Aren't, like are not. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming on to the show tonight. And uh, and you're coming uh, at us from, where where are you located out there? I'm actually in Nevada, northern Nevada. Okay, excellent. Could you go ahead and tell us about yourself and uh, how you became the go-to guy for bibliographies within the world of Warren Publishing and uh, black and white comics in general? Uh, actually, it kind of started by accident. I was um, looking for information on, I had gone to a comic book store, actually a bookstore, and noticed they had a stack of old Warrens, the first 10 or 15 with the Frazetti covers on them, and they were file copies. They'd never been opened. And I went and bought a copy of each one of them because I couldn't afford to buy them all. And in the same stack, there were a number of old Skywald magazines. I don't know if you remember what Skywald was, but it was a Warren competitor. Okay. And I was trying to find information out on them because I vaguely remembered them, but had no clear idea what they were about. But they did have Boris Viejo covers on them also. And uh, there wasn't any information. Even at the Grand Comic Books database had nothing on them except what I knew was incorrect. So I started looking them up myself and... I found a guy who was willing to put them on his website, and suddenly professionals from those books started contacting me, mm-hmm. wanting to know if I knew where such and such a writer was or such and such an artist was. And at one point, Al Hewitson, who was the editor of Skywall, called me up and got in touch with me, and we spent the last two months of his life writing almost daily back and forth. Mm-hmm. And uh, he passed away very suddenly, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, the information that he was able to give me give me gave me the idea of starting the checklist and the interviews and he was the first person I interviewed and the first checklist I completed and after I finished the Skywald one I thought well that was fun I'll do Warren because Warren wasn't complete either and mm-hmm. after a while the Grand Comic Book Database contacted me and asked me if they could use my credits for their their database and I said sure and it just kind of snowballed from there and from there I've gone to uh, interviewing for professionally for pay, which is nice. And I sure. just had a major article in Alter Ego for this month. Uh, Alter Ego is a comic history magazine edited by Roy Thomas, who used to write Conan and The Avengers and all kinds of comics for Marvel. And uh, it's a big article on the comics code and what it did to comics back in the 50s. And, uh, okay, now, now can you can you talk about um, uh, Warren? Now they uh, they had something novel and new about their comic where they could get around the comics code. Now, can you tell us about who instituted the comics code and what Warren did to get around the, uh, the comics code? Well, ironically, the man who started the organization, or at least called it the meeting, was Bill Gaines, who was the editor and publisher of uh, EC Comics, and then. Uh, he discovered at the meeting they were they had had a problem with uh, a number of states trying to legislate comics out of existence because they had gotten very violent. And he didn't think that he didn't like the idea. And he was trying to find a way around it, so he called an organization, and the organization tried to make sure that one of the things they ran out of business was EC Comics. Mm. And so. The, the comics themselves put the comics code in as an effort to get between to show that the legal system that they were actually doing something. Sure. I and, guess it was um, a, a, a sort of a self, um, I guess, a self censorship or self uh, monitoring organization. Yes, and it, it's the same thing. The movies did the same thing back in the '30s. The only difference is the movies kind of paid lip service to it. And the guy they hired to run the comics code was a fanatic on the subject. And mm-hmm. he started banning almost everything left and right. Wow. And he particularly picked on EC Comics and ran them basically out of the color comics business. Mm-hmm. So that when it was all over, the only magazine they had left was Mad Magazine, which of course turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to them. It was taking it to magazine size because they could go around the code. 
Sure. There was no codes restricting magazines, only comic books. And because and Mad Magazine, even though it was ninety percent comics, was a magazine, they said we're not a comic book, we're a magazine. So the code has no effect on us. And they let it stand. And that's when Jim Warren came by about nine, ten years later and did the exact same thing, only he did it with horror comics, which also weren't allowed under the comics code in any way, shape, or form. You could get mystery titles like the old Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko stories, but they were uh, very pale and mild compared to the stuff that had been printed 1954 and earlier. Now, can you, Things can you, that the code you, specifically you, forbid was stuff like zombies and monsters and uh, Dracula, werewolves, all kinds of stuff. Sure. Well, that's all the good stuff. Now, can you tell me the relationship with uh, William Gaines you mentioned, who who went on to be one of the uh, the founders of Mad Magazine, and and his relationship to uh, Tales from the Crypt magazine? Well, Tales from the Crypt was a magazine that he it was a pre code comic book. And he published that as well as Vault of Evil, or Vault of Horror, excuse me, uh-huh. and uh, another magazine. And those three together were the three main horror comics, the ones that were the best of the best, the top of the bunch. They had artwork by Jack Davis and Graham Ingalls, and uh, Al Williamson did artwork for them, Russ Heath did, Joe Kubert did. I mean, just a ton of people. Wally Wood did a lot of work for them. And it wasn't just horror. He also published two science fiction titles. He had two war titles that Harvey Kurtzman edited. He had Mad Magazine, which was also a Kurtzman written and edited magazine. And he had Panic, which was another, it was was a companion humor book. And uh, then he also had a shock story and he had uh, a crime suspense. So he had a lot, and the crime suspense got them as much trouble as the horror comics did. Hmm. But, uh, you know, and those were all magazines that he ended up having to cancel, Hmm. either because of business pressure or because the newsstands wouldn't take EC Comics any longer. Hmm. If you'll look at the original Mad Magazine when he went to magazine size, EC Comics is in very tiny print at the very bottom of the cover, so you can't (laughs) see it when it's put into the slot. That that was strictly so the distributors wouldn't see the EC Comics on it. After a while, after a couple, three issues, he dropped the EC Comics off it completely. So now, could you that was me, Bill um, Gaines. Yeah, well, well, he he has been in publishing for quite a while. Now, can you tell me, now, while we're on the topic of Mad Magazine, I, there was a rumor that they were getting ready to cancel Mad Magazine, that they, they were going to go out of business with the magazine, and they were strictly going to be a TV show, uh, I guess, on, on the Cartoon Network. Is that true or false? Uh, I am, I really don't know about that. I know that that one time it, it's gone downhill professionally, like a lot of other magazines have done. But since Bill Gaines passed away, it has not been as strong a force as it used to be. But it's mm-hmm. still, as far as I know, running running along every other month. It's not monthly like it used to be. I believe it's now bi monthly. And, uh, and well, see, there are. You know, back back when I was a kid. Now, see this this is what uh, this is what's different about being a you know being around in in, in the world of comic books and uh, in uh, illustrated novel uh, graphic novels and things uh, these days as opposed to when I was younger. And uh, you know, when I was a kid, they didn't have the internet, cable TV, uh, VCRs, or video games. We had um, magazines that we could pick up at the at the drugstore, the newsstand. And, and this was pretty much uh, our entertainment back in those days. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I could see where I could see where a, a magazine like Mad and some of these others would be suffering at the newsstand when there's so many other things going on in the world of media. Now, um, now going back uh, in time to the beginning of a uh, Warren Publications. Now, the first Warren publication, the first Warren book was a was a Playboy uh, takeoff called After Hours. Okay, and he, that only lasted that only lasted three or four issues before the police in Philadelphia cracked down on him and ran him out of business <laughs> by threatening to prosecute okay. him for for obscenity. And he did a few other one shot type magazines, and then he he and a fellow a science fiction fan by the name of Forrest Ackerman uh-huh. uh, got together and put out what was intended to be originally just another one shot magazine called Famous Monsters from Filmland. 
and it was a huge hit. Sure. I I think that very first issue must have paid for all the debts he had left over from the after hours problems because in in within a year or two he had it running bi monthly and then monthly. It ran for a long time. From nineteen fifty eight or fifty nine right to the very end of Warren when when Warren publication shut up shop. It ran the entire time, right through to the early eighties. And okay. from there he did uh more. He did some few tried a few on science fiction. There was Spaceman and he did a few Western uh Western film magazines, and then he started Help, which was a kind of a humor magazine that mm-hmm. EC veteran Harvey Kurtzman was putting together. And he had on uh, Kurtzman had like people like Terry Gilliam, who is now a major director, was one of the writers. Sure. He was also a member of Monty Python, the American member. Mm-hmm. And he had um, uh, Gloria Steinem was on staff. Right. It, it had a lot of impressive people. Very young in their careers, but they were very impressive people, as it turned out. And so, Help ran for about five or six years, and then he did a he did his first full comic book was actually a Flintstone comic book done for the 1964 New York World's Fair. And from there, somebody and nobody's quite sure because at least three different people try to claim credit for it, including Jim Warren, mm-hmm. uh, came up with the idea of publishing a black and white full-size magazine doing horror comics. The very first issue was supposed to be a tribute to EC Comics. All the artists in the book, except for one, was a EC comic veteran. Wow. And and the one story that wasn't was actually delivered to the wrong artist. It was supposed to go to Wally Wood, but it ended up going to Gray Morrow, who was not an EC artist. He came in afterwards. and But he was still a pretty good artist. But... Um, you can see that they were a little worried about when they put that first issue out because it does not have a horror cover on it. Mm-hmm. It's got a Jack Davis humorous cover like he would have done for Mad Magazine. Mm-hmm. And the and the Frazetti horror covers didn't come in until issue two. They were a little nervous. No <laughs> one knew what to expect. No one knew if they were going to have screaming parents coming in trying to legislate them out of existence again. But it was a success, and it open the floodgates to a lot of really bad magazines and a lot of really good ones. Now, um, uh, could you tell me, is was there an actual relationship between the these gentlemen know each other, James Warren and Hugh Hefner? Um, I think they knew each other to a certain extent. Certainly Hefner knew about After Hours, and I believe there was some correspondence about how to avoid getting prosecuted. But as far as um, practical experience, because, I don't really know. I know that some of the artists who worked for Warren also worked for Playboy. Mm-hmm. Russ Heath um, did work for both Warren and for uh, little Annie Fanny. So there were crossovers between them. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of interconnections where you don't see the obvious things. For example, the lady, who, uh, Vampirella, who is probably one of the most sexist characters in comics, <laughs> at least when it started out, was actually designed by a feminist. Sure. Trina Robbins, who was an underground cartoonist and uh, was a major feminist in the underground comics movement, mm-hmm. was the person who designed Vampirella's costume and sent it to Frank Frazetti so he could paint that very first cover. So there was a lot of... Uh, Give and take between different types of things. People that you wouldn't think would be working there worked there. People you would think would have worked there didn't or didn't do very much there. But it did inspire, particularly in the early years, uh, a tremendous amount of art that was just as as good as anything you could ever look for in comics. Sure. Um, and yeah, they had Frank Vizzetti. They had Angelo Torres. They had Steve Ditko when, he was, when Ditko was at his absolute top best. Um, they had Wally Wood they had Alex Toth they had Gray Marl I mean and these were just regular artists they weren't like big names that you were saying oh this is person is going to do these were just their regular every every issue artist and it was a one of a time thing because uh, if he tried opening that magazine a year later he wouldn't have had any of those people mm-hmm. they were all on the cusp of bigger and better things Frazetti of course was just moving into paperback covers he had been ghosting Little Abner. 
and doing some book covers, but they were mostly fan book covers. And then he, he moved full time in, and of course, there's a lot better paying money in paperback covers than there were in comic book covers. Could you tell us about the uh, careers, uh, some more of the, of, the, of the tales of the careers of the artists and the writers in the glory days, these black and white magazines? And uh, do you have any idea of what some of these uh, folks are doing nowadays? Well, unfortunately, a great many of them have passed away. Um, mm-hmm. There's still a few that are still around, though. Um, Archie Goodwin, who was probably the best, he was the editor for the first three years, and he wrote almost every single story in those first three years' worth of issues. Mm-hmm. And he he was a great writer all through his career, a great editor. He, he gets kudos from almost everybody who ever worked for him. I say, they all say he's the best editor they ever worked with because he knew how to draw the best out of everybody, and often for very little money. Mm-hmm. But he made you feel good about yourself for working for him. And he was a superb writer. He's not as flashy as, say, Alan Moore or Neil Gaiman, but he never delivered anything less than a solid story. Mm-hmm. And editing-wise, he edited Creepy and Eerie, and for those first few years, he edited Vampirella for a number of years. He did. He was the editor-in-chief at Marvel for a while. He ran their Epics comic line. In the last few years before his death, he was running Batman, editing mm-hmm. Batman. Uh, he commissioned uh, Bernie Wrightson's, one of only two Bernie Wrightson Batman issues. It didn't see print during his lifetime. In fact, it didn't see print for nearly 10 years, but it was still an Archie Goodwin project. And uh, he he was a, a extremely influential, and I think probably the best single writer they ever had. Um, artist and writer Steve Ditko is still alive and still producing, and actually he self-publishes his own work nowadays. Um, Russ Heath is still alive. He does uh, commissions. He's living in California. And Russ Heath is, I don't know if you know what his work is, was, but he, he did Sergeant Rock for many, many years. Uh, like I mentioned, he'd worked on Little Annie Fanny. He was um, he, he, he's, he's probably the, the finest single artist, I think, that Warren ever managed to produce. Mm-hmm. Except, and there are people who would argue the Frazetti, but Frazetti only drew one story, and Heath drew probably close to two dozen. Mm-hmm. For them off and on over the years, and he was an exceptional artist. Plus, he drew gorgeous babes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, because he drew little Annie Fanny. He knew how to draw a girl. Um, sure, sure. Uh, some of the other one, Gray Morrow, unfortunately took his own life a few years ago, and he developed a disease that mm-hmm. prevented him from drawing. Uh, Wally Wood passed away. Same thing. He was a suicide. Mm-hmm. Um. Angelo Torres is still working. He works still at Mad Magazine, and he's also st- contributed stories to the new Creepy, which Dark Horse is uh, publishing. Okay. Uh, Gene Colan recently passed away, but he also delivered uh, some artwork to the to the new Creepy, as did Manuel San Julian. He painted a new cover for them just recently. Mm-hmm. So he's still alive. Um. Doug Minch, who wrote a lot of the stories in the 70s for uh, Creepy and Eerie, as well as a ton of stories for Marvel, is still working, although he's doing mostly television nowadays. Um, anybody else you want to hear about in particular? Or? Well, uh, I, I, I've recently become uh, I befriended a gentleman by the name of Bud Lewis, who now resides in, uh, in Oregon. Who's now yes, in I, I know Bud. Bud. He he went on to uh he went on to work in storyboarding, uh I guess in uh in uh, Hollywood a little while. And uh, mm-hmm. he actually wrote a couple screenplays for uh, James Cameron when uh, as Bud put it, uh he was fresh off the turnip truck from Canada. So uh that makes for uh, some fun uh some fun stories there too. Well Bud was a really good writer. Um he his very first story was an excellent one and he had probably the best artist that Warren had at that time, Estavion Morato, mm-hmm. illustrated it. Unfortunately, Bud didn't get credit for it. It was credited to Doug Minch. But they corrected the mistake later in a later issue. But uh, it was a beautiful story about a British soldier in Canada who was uh, starving in the freezing cold, and it was just a crackerjack story called A Most Private Fear. He's in the night, it's freeze, freezing to death, and he's seeing visions. And it's really a good story. 
one of the better ones uh, that Warren put out. And he also did uh, God Eye, which is one of the funniest Warren stories I ever read. So Bud is, was a good writer. He also worked on The Rook. Mm-hmm. And uh, The Rook was a time traveler that appeared in Erie Magazine, and then he graduated into his own uh, black and white magazine for a few years. Mm-hmm. I, I think Bud was one of the better writers that they had at the time. Now, um, on, on, when you're out and about and you meet up with these uh, these celebrities, these artists and writers, uh, the ones that are still around that do come out and participate in conventions for, uh, might have inspired the minds behind modern-day comics, films, and video games. Well, I think they've inspired quite a lot. Certainly uh, the what they used to call the Young Turks that came around in 1969, 1970, which would have been Bernie Wrightson and Mike Kaluta and Jeff Jones – They've influenced a tremendous amount in in movies. Um, Wrightson's uh, and Bruce Jones, who was also an artist. Bruce Jones wrote a lot of stories, but he was he started out as an artist like Al Williamson. And uh, their um, story Jennifer was recently made a couple years ago on the Masters of Terror television series. Um, and it was the only comic book story that was adapted for that series, and it's still a pretty scary story. It's one of the most terrifying I've ever read in that book. Um, Bernie Wrightson has done a lot of uh, storyboard artwork. So has Mike Vosberg. As a matter of fact, Mike, I was just talking to him the other day. He's been working on the Narnia films for the last few years, doing the storyboards for them. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of work both at Warren and over at Marvel. Uh, And, of course, Bernie did Swamp Thing and... He's done Batman. He's done a lot of work over the. He did The Punisher. Well, uh, Bernie is probably the premier horror artist, particularly in the seventies and, and early eighties. His his work was adapted for a heavy metal movie, so he's done a lot. That's it's been influenced in movies, and and people who don't even know they've been influenced by him are influenced by him. When you see a monster like the werewolves and stuff that looks so graphically scary in the movies. That's a direct inspiration from those old Warren comics. Sure, in fact, sure. sometimes I can watch a show and say, I know exactly where that guy stole that bit from. <laughs> because it's it's I remember the story it came out of. As a matter of fact, I was watching some movie a few weeks ago that I was saying, I know where that came from. And it was from an old Warren comic. So... I remember I had a, a, a Warren uh, publication. It was a digest-sized uh, publication it was a creepy collection of stories creepy and uh and there was uh, like a vampire getting attacked by a werewolf and i just saw um van helsing the other night on tv and it was just a flashback to that cover of that uh the digest magazine well the whole but van helsing thing is a rip off of of uh marvel comic solomon <laughs> kane the costume the hat the weapons uh-huh. the whole stick is off robert e howard and and uh and there and Ralph Reese's uh, initial drawings of Solomon Kane from 1973. Mm-hmm. Every detail. <laughs> I mean, if you go back and you look at those old Marvel comics from Savage Tales, Solomon yeah. Kane looks exactly like Van Helsing, and Hugh Jackman is the perfect actor to play him because he looks exactly like him. Long hair, big broad hat, the hip, the knee high boots, the whole thing, black clothes, <laughs> everything. Book- the book you're working on uh, is called Black Days, Darker Nights, The 20-Year History of Black and White Horror Magazines. Um, when I was at the convention, the World Science Fiction Convention this summer, I they had a bo- McFarland had a booth there where they were selling books, and I was chatting to the publisher while I was buying one of his books, and he said, uh, he was, he, I, I noticed he had a comic uh, book magazine that I didn't think too highly of because I... I I'm not going to mention the title or anything because, as I said, I didn't think that highly of it. And I says, there are better stuff than this available out there. And he says, well, do you know of anybody who can do it? And I says, well, I can. And he said, well, show me what you can do. And I sent him in some of the uh, website material that I had. And he said, yes. And it was very, very quick. He said, yes, we'd like to do it. How soon can you get a book done? And I said, I can get it done, I think, in this time. And they said, fine, well, let's do it. And that was the extent of it. It was very, very fast, very, very easy. If I'd known it was going to be that easy, I'd have done it a long time ago. (laughs) (laughs) 
But it's going to not just Warren. It's going to cover Skywald and Marvel's Black and White, and all. In fact, all of the Black and White magazines that had that either fully focused on horror or that had a great deal of horror in them. Okay. That means I can't do some of the ones I really like, like Warren Spirit magazine doesn't fit within the parameters. But that's okay because I I am getting Blazing Combat in there, so I'm happy. All right. So so tell me. Um, uh, Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the DC's um, uh, department there, where they had the uh, the big book of um, the big book series. Can we talk a little bit about that real quick, and then you can go sure. right on into uh, uh, comics, black and white comics, all things comics. Well, the big books were trade paperbacks, but magazine sized trade paperbacks. They were large. Um, they all were between three to five pages sometimes just a single page. They had an astounding selection of artists. Russ Heath worked on them. Tom Sutton did before his death. Um, uh, just hundreds, literally hundreds of artists worked on them. There was probably about 15 to 16 of them. And they even spun off a small, short-lived black-and-white magazine for a number of years. Um they had big books that you mentioned. The first one was Urban Legends. They also had one called The Big Book of Conspiracies, where mm-hmm. one of the stories I remember was uh, discussing uh, George Bush's various activities through the 60s and 70s, where he seemed mm-hmm. to be at the center of an awful lot of bad things. George Bush, our they also were talking the senior about some of the, uh, daddy president. Yeah, and and they also uh, they also uh, touched upon uh, Bill Clinton. Other, uh, I mean, it's not like it was an attack on Republicans at all. They they got into no. depth on different uh, different conspiracies involving uh, different uh, people from both sides. Oh, that's true. That was, it was any kind of conspiracy that it didn't have to be. Obviously, many of them are well, belong to the Looney Tune Brigade of of conspiracies. But they would discuss any kind of conspiracy somebody was actually thinking actually happened. It was up to you to decide whether it was true or whether it wasn't. They didn't say they didn't try to disprove the conspiracy. They just told what the conspiracy was about. So, I thought that was an interesting approach. Sure. So, in the same way with the urban legends, they they just simply told the story of the legend. They didn't try to say, oh, well, and it's obviously not true because blah blah. They didn't do any of that, which is yeah. just fine with me. But they were an excellent series. They ran for probably four or five years in the late 90s, and um, they're well worth looking for in the back market. Some of them are actually quite pricey on the back market nowadays, sure. depending on which book they were and the print run. But uh, there was some very good material in there, and it wasn't all conspiracies or urban legends. They actually, I think they did had one on crime, uh, which was – Short, but they were actually quite accurate in the terms of the crime stuff. I've read up on a lot of the crime material, and it was they were they weren't fudging the facts on that. It was straight up crime reporting, abbreviated crime reporting, but still crime reporting. And there was a big book on the West. And it was the the big book, the, the weird Wild West. And, and yes, and most of the stories in there were actually true stories. And I mean, these are stories that have not been related. Uh, to the, the public, you know, in, in at large for um, for quite a while because I wasn't familiar with any of them. Well, maybe of course the one about the Donner Party. Everybody's heard of that one. But outside of that, there's a lot of stories in there that have gone untold for for many years. Or if they were told, they were told in like local state. I mean, there's a ghost story right in my hometown that I've never heard of before, but it's actually a pretty good ghost story, and it was reported at the time. Uh, in all its particulars, so it was it was an interesting story. The story was reported in the local paper back in the 1890s, and it was uh, a farmer and his wife had purchased a farm, and they were telling that they seemed to have a ghost in the house because they would hear all the traditional stuff you hear ghosts doing, you know, rattling the chairs, knocking the kerosene lamps, because that's what they had back in the time, would be blown out, that sort of thing. And they said the phenomena seemed to be more excessive in the basement. So one day the husband decided he would go down in the basement and see where where the activity was most concentrated. And while he was there, he decided to dig in a cellar floor, and he uncovered a body laying in it. 
And uh, since they had just purchased the farm only two or three months before, of course, the people who owned the farm before them were, of course, suspects. And they caught them in Montana, a husband and wife team. And it turned out the body was one of their neighbors who had vanished. And they apparently hit him over the head with a shovel and buried him in the basement. And so, in that case, a murder was uncovered by a ghost. Because the ghost stuff was reported long before they found the body. Yeah, that's wild. So, And that's something they bring up every Halloween. They bring up the new old papers and the original trial transcripts and stuff. It's actually quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's the, the the big book, The Weird Wild West, has a, a lot of stories about um, murders. And there's a, a few ghostly legends in the back. I have one chapter dedicated to uh, to the legends, um, but for the most part, it's true stories. And there's another. There's a story that takes place in Kansas about a, a a family of immigrants from Germany, I believe it was, who um, who used to run a little, uh, I guess, um, a bed and breakfast. And are you uh, talking about the vendors? Yes, yes, the benders. All right. Yes, female serial killer in this case. Yeah, the whole family. Or female whole brains family. behind the group. Yeah, Rick but, Geary uh, did a whole book on that called The Bloody, okay. the Saga of the Bloody Benders. It's actually pretty good. It's part of his um, 19th century murder series. Oh, it's, cool. it's been done as a comic book. Awesome. Well, I'm sure it's just a matter of time before it's a uh, feature film. Oh, it would make a good film. I don't think it's ever been adapted into a film yet. Oh, man. Lizzie we Borden, be, uh, of course, was. We might be breaking ground here tonight. We may be on the springboard of uh, – I've got people that are after me to do a Western so desperately, and I've got people that are after me to do uh, – do uh, another serial killer monster movie, so I think I could bring uh, the, both the uh, worlds together. Best of both well, worlds. Bring them both in. Bender's movie. <laughs> Sounds good. Sure, I think you but, could uh, do a really good spooky movie about the Benders, especially oh, since they oh. were never caught. So. Yeah, that's true. Man, how 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 wild is that? Um, so, uh, all right, getting back to the comics. So you, you're a, you're a bona fide expert on the black and white comics, and you're writing a book that's uh, about uh, the, the the history of black and white comics. But you're also, of course, an expert in all comics. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's talk a little bit more. And by the way, I'm, I almost got my collection of 1984, 1994 comics together. I figure I'd start small with cool. a with a smaller run of comics, um, and, uh, and kind of work backwards into uh, into the creepy collections. Uh, because uh, that, those uh, really are where most of my favorite stories are are in the uh, the uh, the creepy magazines. And we were talking a bit last week off air about the, resurre- the initial resurrection issue that that came out uh, several months to about a year after uh, Creepy went out of business back in the 80s, and uh, and about the fact that there were a couple of stories that were referencing Missouri, where I'm from here, and you indicated that that was. Uh, most likely because the couple of the uh, personalities behind uh, uh, Creepy at the time, at least that issue, were from Missouri. Chief. Oh, well, Rich Colbert, of course, was is is and still is a Missourian. Um, he painted the cover for that issue. And um, Bruce Jones, of course, came from Missouri. Actually, quite a few comic professionals came from Missouri. I don't know why. Roy Thomas came from there, of course, and Gary Friedrich, uh, who wrote Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos for many years, also wrote The Monster of Frankenstein, The Good Issues, uh, with Mike, artist Mike Plug. He came from Missouri. Cool. Uh, so there's actually, there was a, at least for, I don't know that they stayed in Missouri except for Richard, but Bruce Jones moved back there for quite some, he lived there for quite some time before he moved out to California. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was probably, I'm sure that some of Colburn's, uh, Underground friends are, live in that area too. It would be much easier to work with people who are local than it is to do sure. long distance scripting and that sort of thing. So I, I suspect there's more than a few of those also that lived in Missouri at the time. Yeah. Now, real quick, you you mentioned that um, that uh, Dark Horse Comics pretty much took up uh, the licensing for the creepy, uh, I guess, property, and, uh, and they've uh, been putting out new. Uh, 
issues are creepy. Now, how long have they been uh, publishing creepy uh, since they've gotten back into it? Well, it's it's two years, but they they were they the issues are not coming out regularly yet. There's only the seventh issue is is on its way, from what I understand. But it's actually it came out two years ago. The first issue. Is the original uh, creepy comics is it black and white or color? It's black and white. They they kept it that traditional. It's comic book size though, not magazine size. And okay. it's, um, I believe, 48-page issues. And okay. they reprint okay. one classic story from the old Creepy or Eerie, each issue, and then they have basically about 40 pages of new comics. And they do, and actually they contacted me in, in the hopes of finding a few more of the old vets um, to work on stories for them. I think I recommend Bud Lewis to them. and sure. Mention, of course, that Russ Heath is still alive and might be interested. But uh, they have made a concentrated effort. They've gotten a couple of cover artists, Ken Kelly and Manuel San Julian, who both did a lot of work for the original Eerie and Creepy, have both done covers for the book, the new book. And they are going to revive, I believe, Eerie sometime this year, or next year, I'm sorry, as an 80-page book. I'm not sure if it's an annual or if it's going to be a quarterly or how they're going to work it, but it's going to be larger than the Creepy is. At least that's the word I'm getting on. How far that actually goes, you know, until it actually comes out, you can't always say it's actually going to happen. Sure. Now, now, uh, Dark Horse, they hold all the rights to all of the uh, Warren Publishing titles, as far as you know, or just no, they don't. Um, Fantagraphics has Blazing Combat. That was sold off to a different individual. That particular magazine. Okay. So Fantagraphics published the Blazing Combat volume. There's only one. And okay. then uh, Dynamite has currently has the Vampirella rights and the rights okay. to the original magazine. Sure. And I believe the Rook is actually owned by either Bud Lewis or Bill Dubay's um, estate. I'm sure. not sure which at this particular time. But I believe it's a separate entity altogether. Now, Bud did mention to me the other day that he was writing the introduction to the new Hunter book. They're going to publish all the Hunter stories in a single volume starting in, I believe it comes out in April. Oh, and it will cool. take all the Hunters from Hunter 1 and Hunter 2 and Hunter 3 and then a couple of the spoof stories that were done around Hunter. So everything that's all, all those stories that were Hunter stories are actually going to be collected into one volume. Oh, that's awesome. He's going to write the introduction to that. Well, I'll definitely put that on my uh, list of uh, things to look out for. Um, now, uh, Dark Horse Comics, getting back to Dark Horse, what, what are they best known for? Well, they also have the Conan the Barbarian license at the moment. Uh, they also publish Hellboy. Um, they publish The Goon. They do a lot of that. They have the Star Wars uh, comic rights. So they actually are do a fairly good business in terms of that type of thing. Um, published a lot of material over the years that was unique. They did Dark Horse Presents. It was a 32-page black and white anthology, and it ran for, oh, Lord, almost 15 years or something. And now they've revived that as a 80-page color comic, and they have some very impressive people working in it. Neil Adams is doing a serial. Howard Chaikin is doing a serial for them. Paul Pope has worked for it. Jeff Darrow. I mean, it's high-class high-priced anthology, but it's actually pretty good. So I like it anyway. So I would recommend uh, Dark Horse Presents and uh, the creepy archives that they publish and the Conan. All the Conan and Hellboy stuff is excellent material. So Dark Horse is probably, pound for pound, they publish more magazines that I'm interested in than either DC or Marvel at this point in time. How many comics do you own altogether, do you think? Oh God, I have it, it's in the thousands, but I have no idea off the top of my head exactly how many. I know that my closet is stuffed. Um, so what What are your favorite comics? I mean, do you, do you, are there some that you uh, you know? If you're like me, you've got so many comics, you've got them in storage, um, but you probably have a few on your bookshelf or, or readily in hand. Uh, what, what would be your favorite comics that you keep on hand? On hand, uh, I keep all the Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman books on hand all the time. Also, the Fable books. I think Fables is probably the best single comic being published today. Uh, It's beautifully drawn by Mark Buckingham. It's beautifully written by Bill Willingham, who's a pretty darn fine artist in his own right. Um, 
It's smart. It's been ripped off for that TV show that's on Sunday nights. <laughs> so I don't know what it's called, but there's a fairy tale show on Sunday night that I know for a fact is <laughs> kind of a rip off, but yeah. it appears to be doing quite well once upon a time, that's what they're calling it. Yeah, yeah. But it's basically the same basic notion. But uh you know, you can't do much about that sort of thing. I'm sure that Jack Kirby was probably spinning in his grave watching Star Wars, so um, of all the graphic novels are are getting picked up by filmmakers uh, quite a bit nowadays. And um, what are your, some of your favorite films based on graphic novels? And um, what are some of your uh, your favorite graphic novels that you think should be picked up uh, by filmmakers and made into feature films? Um, I thought the V for Vendetta was quite well done. Uh, it's sure. not as good as the book, but it's pretty good. And it seems to have started a kind of movement all of its own on as far as wearing the Guy Falk mask for protest stuff. So that's kind oh, of yeah. cool. I liked Watchmen. I thought it was actually probably as accurate as any movie I've ever seen following a comic. Okay. Um, I thought Sin City was all right. Sure. The book Again, the books are better, but it's the way it goes. I like the second Spider-Man movie. I like Captain America. I thought it was very well done. Um, unlike a lot of people, I actually thought the Fantastic Four movies were good. Okay. Didn't like Daredevil, but I think I'm probably in the majority on that one. I didn't think it worked very well. Catwoman was sure. a travesty. The Batman movies... The Chris Nolan movies are very good, and the very first one with Michael Keaton was good, but the rest of them stunk. Yeah. <laughs> so, but Nolan has done a very good job with the first two, and I'm hoping the sure. third one that he's got coming out next year is going to be equally as, as good. He certainly has oh, a very good sure. cast for it. That's gonna be um, I actually, I think that for the first time. Hollywood is has people who have actually read comics who are actually making the movies now. That did not used sure. to be the case. When the first Batman series and the first Superman series were going, and you listen to some of the concepts they were tossing around, you were thinking, oh, my God, have they never read a comic book? And most of them probably hadn't, or hadn't since they were a kid. And uh, they were awful. I listened to some of the concepts that they were trying. I mean, who who in their right mind would think Jack Nicholson for Superman? <laughs> I can't even conceive the notion that – or Nicolas Cage. He was seriously being considered for Superman. Yeah. I can't imagine how anybody could think either one of those two actors. Now, Nicholson is a joker. I can handle. He's quite good at that. Sure. Nick Cage is a ghostwriter. Okay, I, I mean any play actor could play the ghostwriter. He has no distinctive character whatsoever. So <laughs> anybody could play it. Sure, but and, uh, uh, you know Superman's got a character, and he's got a certain look that the whole world knows. You can't just throw some, anybody in there. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I was. So what, I did an interview with Gary Conway last summer, and he was laughing over the fact that they cast Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy. And he says, mm -hmm. if ever there was an actress who should be Mary Jane Watson, it's Emma Stone. She looks like her, she talks like her, she's got the attitude of her, but they yeah. dyed her hair and made her Gwen Stacy, who he thought was yeah. a very bland character, and then he killed her, so what can you say? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, I, and I, I have to agree with him. I think that's, she's a perfect actress to play Mary Jane Watson in the Spider-Man movies. Sure. But they have her playing Gwen Stacy. Go figure. Yeah. So, so. what would be uh, some uh, graphic novels or comic book characters that would make great uh, characters in feature films? That have not been done yet? Yes. Um, I think there are some war comics that would make very good films. The Lonely War of Captain Willie Schultz would make a really good movie. Um. In superheroes, I think they've pretty much hit in everybody, except for maybe Doctor Strange. I would like to see a Doctor Strange movie sometime. Uh, but most of the main superheroes have either been done or are going to be done at some point in time. I don't have any doubt on that, because yeah. they're making money on those. There's a second Ghost Rider oh, yeah. movie being filmed right now. Um, 
I understand there may be a Punisher movie coming out in the near future. So, and the Punisher not that different is not that far off. It's just a goofy costume. He could be played straight okay. easily without having a costume put on it. Yeah. Um, I think that the the real thing about comics is you have to start, and they have to a certain extent that you have to start looking at the stuff that's non traditional superhero stuff. There's some really good stories out there. Sure. Fables should be made into a movie series. Um, sure. And not just Fables. I think Hellraiser, they did one movie, but they cast Keanu Reeves as the character, so that was a waste of time. But sure. I, I think if somebody did a Hell, uh, Hellraiser movie with John, somebody, an Englishman playing John Constantine, that would be a good movie. Um, I think there's one called, um, oh, I'm just going to say Stray Toasters, but that, it's Jeff L- Lemire's book and i can't stray something i can't think of the last word in the title my brain's freezing on me but uh i think that one would make a good movie um do, do, do you remember the, the the character um the comic character iron fist yeah he's a kung fu character with a exactly. special blazing fist electromagnetic I I, fist i think that would make such a i mean uh that would be like a uh, that would be like a, a great amalgam of two great uh, genres of film: martial arts and uh, and comic books. I think that would be a terrific character to bring to the to the big screen. But they need to get somebody from Hong Kong to direct it, so they know what they're doing. Oh sure, not an American oh. director. Yeah, that would be that would be a good one. But you're right. But I I think that either that or Master of Kung Fu would make a good one. Okay. They'd never be able to get the rights to Master of Kung Fu, though. They'd have the same problem they have with trying to collect it as a as a collection. Yeah. Uh, Marvel put Fu Manchu into the book, and no one noticed that he wasn't out of copyright. And, oh. Uh, so they've lost the ability to the copyright ability, and he's Fu Manchu, just like in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Alan Moore wrote it with Fu Manchu as the villain. When they went to do the movie, they couldn't use Fu Manchu. They had to come up with a different villain for the movie. And of course, uh, well, the movie didn't work very well anyway because they yeah. Hollywood changed it. But uh, the book is is the villain is Fu Manchu, an entirely appropriate villain for that time period. But you know, you, sure. would, you, you got problems with all kinds of stuff that you, companies that have gone out of business. Um, I think the Blackhawks might make a good movie. If somebody could figure out a way to do it accurately, it'd have to be set in World War II. It, they don't work any other period but that, but I think that would be a good movie. Well, sure. Um, and I think that there's a lot of horror stories from war, and I could see somebody doing starting a TV show and just doing war and stuff like they did Tales from the Crypt. Oh, I agree. Oh, I, could I think that there's horror. plenty of stories in there that would work well as a half-hour TV show. Absolutely. So I, I can't see movies in particular being made from most of that, but sometimes, yeah. I, I could see that easily you see a, a half-hour syndicated show like Tales from the Dark Side or something sure. being done with a Warren. Uh, that's uh, that's what I'm looking forward to most. I believe it's going to happen. It's a matter of time. I think people are, are very interested in, in kind of like the vignetted uh, style of films and TV shows that are horror-based and and, uh, and things, a uh, creep show uh, scenario. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think uh, the creep show thing would work quite well. I think that one of the things that's really nice about today's market is that you don't have to do 22 shows every season. You yeah. could do like 13 shows and make them really, really good shows and show them on Showtime or HBO or uh, even TBS or something like that. Sure. Um, and and you would have an excellent hour long series of anthology. Sometimes a whole hour would be used. Sometimes you might get a two shows or two episodes or three episodes in an hour. Night Gallery used to do that all the time, but they just couldn't keep up the good, the good stuff. It, it was fifty percent good stuff and fifty percent well crap. That was tough. You you you'd get really interested, and then you'd be watching something that you knew was a piece of garbage. <laughs> or you would get an entire episode that was all garbage, and who would want to go back after this next week to see something? But I think you could do that if you made sure that every show was top of the drawer. Sure. 
And it, you could do that with 13. I don't think you can do it with 22 in a season. 22 separate episodes. Is there uh, anything else that you want to add in regard to uh, black and white comics? Um, the, the black and white comic field, although I deal, I, my book's mostly about the horror, there's also a lot of adventure and um, they, they were, there's quite a few titles that were in other genres. Um, uh, the Rook title had some excellent, even though the Rook himself, eh, you can take him or leave him sometime. He had beautiful artwork by a fellow from uh, Spain. But the backup stories, you would have stuff by John Severin. Uh, you would have a Western. Um, there was uh, 1930s Adventures from Alex Toth. He did Bravo for Adventure that ran in the back. Alfredo Acala did absolutely gorgeous uh, sword and sorcery stuff with his Voltar that's wrote in the back of that magazine. Um, there was something called the Viking Prince, although it had nothing to do with the, but DC's Viking Prince, but they did have a Viking Prince character there from Spain that was translated. Uh, and, of course, you had the Spirit. It ran in two or three different companies before DC acquired control of it. And uh, they were all in black and white comics, and they're from Kitchen Sink or from uh, Harvey Comics did a color version of it. Those are really excellent books and things that you can look out for. They're not that necessarily that expensive. And uh, and you really haven't seen Will Eisner until you've seen his work in large size black and white. It's just stunning. Hmm. Absolutely stunning. And he could do all kinds of story. There'd be a horror story. There'd be a comedy story. There'd be a crime story. It didn't matter. He would do a fable. He would do a myth. He would do a love story that was jerk your strings of your heart like you would not believe. And then the next month he'd do a story that was told entirely in rhyme. Uh, they're, they're just fascinating to read. And there's also Don McGregor and Tom Sutton did a lot of work for a magazine called Eclipse that was really beautifully done, the slice of life type of stuff. The Twin in the Doorway, I thought, was a particularly good story of theirs. Um, there's all kinds of little stuff that you find that suddenly enriches your life. Uh, Alex Toth did one for a magazine called Bop. It was called Taps, and it was about the death of Wally Wood. And it was all it was was a character dancing for five pages, but it was just it. By the end of it, you were just wrung out emotionally. It was just a fabulous story, hmm. and uh, it was well. I, I I enjoyed the heck out of it. And and you keep discovering new stuff all the time. You know, Bernie Craigstein. Oh, what a fascinating artist! Just stunning story after story after story after story. And so far, like 30, 40 years ahead of his time. Hmm. Or Barry Windsor Smith. Again, a, a guy who seemed to reach back in time, back to the 19th century, but all of his stuff is beautiful. Hmm. Um, I, I just think that comics have a, is a treasure trove, and it's not been really well developed. There's a lot of stuff that's out of print, a lot of stuff that's, People think, oh, well, um, John Stanley, another great writer in the field, also did little kid stuff. He drew, wrote and drew Little Lulu for 15, 20 years or something. But he wrote some startlingly creepy horror stories. Mm -hmm. And The Monster of Dread End is one of the best. It's about a young boy who goes into his old neighborhood, which is abandoned, and underneath the ground is this monstrous snake-like thing with a hand with got sucker mouths on its fingertips and it comes up and snatches children out of their beds and this was published in a kid's comic mm -hmm. and it's absolutely terrifying and the worst thing about it is the kid unknown to him he's being used as bait by the police to draw the thing out so i was thinking <laughs> wow what a callous disregard for <laughs> young children <laughs> but uh yeah they he the thing comes after him and it slid there he he's He's sitting on a corner watching it come out, and it goes down the street, and he thinks it's gone down the street. It's actually curved up and gone into the building behind him, and it's coming out a window behind him and reaching up to grab him from behind. I could see that scaring the crap out of every little kid I was would have known yeah. at that time. That's a, It's a scary story. 
Wow. But uh, it has been recently republished, though, and I like that. It was published in the Mammoth Book of uh, Best Horror Stories a couple okay. of years ago. So if you know, it, the whole book's in black and white, and that's a good thing. Cool. So... Well, I, I would urge anybody to to pick up. There's four mammoth books, and three of them are essential ones. I think. Okay. The Mammoth Book of War, the Mammoth Book of Crime, and the Mammoth Book of uh, Horror. Cool. And they're all still on Amazon, and you should grab them. They're cheap, and they're like five, six hundred pages a piece. Of and they also oh. yeah, the fourth one is the zombie comics. It focuses exclusively on zombies. So if you're a big zombie fan, there you go. Okay. Well, that's. It's like I'm going to have to grab all four of those. But um, um, now earlier you mentioned Fantagraphics, uh, which is um, uh, uh, I guess a uh, it's a comic book uh, distributor. They have a location in Seattle, I believe, um, but they're also a publisher as well. Is that right? Uh, what's the name again? Uh, Fantagraphics out of Seattle. Oh, Fantagraphics. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they publish. Uh... Uh, very hoity-toity uh, comics. Um, occasionally they'll print one that's mainstream, and they do a lot of excellent reprinting of news strips, um, newspaper comic strips. And um, so, so, and they did Blazing I, Combat, and they've done a few mainstream books, but a lot of their stuff is um, Art Spiegelman and that sort of thing, in the mouse and the um, Richard Crumb and those characters. All right, now they're they're kind of well known for having adult related materials. Now, are they just a distributor or a publisher of of uh, some? They of also material? publish porn. Yeah, they oh, do publish oh, porn. Right? Yes, under their Eros line, they publish a, a string of uh, porn novels and porn comics. Okay, some so of them, first, most of them are terrible, first, but some of them are actually pretty good. This is a company that at, publishes Peanuts, the collected Peanuts. Okay. Charles Schultz's Peanuts, and also publishes Housewives at Play. You yeah. know, you get that, that's a pretty long stretch across the spectrums. Kid books, sure. and porn. What, what can you say? They're a well-rounded <laughs> publishing outfit. <laughs> I guess so. But you know, everybody. You know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, some of that stuff's not terrible. They did reprint all of Canon, Wally Wood's Canon. So okay. give them credit for that. Um. And Pipsqueak papers from Wits End, they'd reprinted those. So uh, there's a lot in their, their porn line that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, but once in a while they come out with something that's worth looking at. <laughs> Good stuff. So, and they're not the only ones who publish pornography. The folks who publish Rick Geary's uh, novels, NBM, uh, also publish a porn line. So... In fact, I discovered that to my chagrin because I ordered a Craig Russell book of Oscar Wilde adaptations from them. Mm-hmm. And they sent it to my school with the catalog. And the catalog oh. looked fine, except that the first four pages of the catalog were of their kids' books, and the last four pages were of their adult books, and then the center eight pages were all porn advertisements. And, I, and wow. the local reverend came and opened it up and was looking through it. I go, oh, my God. But huh. he just laughed. I told him what was going on. I showed him the book I'd bought from him, and that was all right. So, But I'm glad he spotted it, not one of the kids. So, Sure. But, uh, you know, things go that way. Um, I don't particularly have any particular problem with uh, nudity or sex in comics. I probably should have a little bit better. I have comics all over the house, and the girls never seem to mind. My daughters never seem to mind seeing some of them sitting there, and they have nude people on all of them. So, I mean, if you have a Frank Rossetti book, you're going to have nudes in the house. Sure, sure. So that's the way it goes. <laughs> Frazetta mean, was kind of like my generation's introduction to, uh, as a teenager, it's cool to have Frazetta T-shirts or Frazetta books, and it's kind of like an introduction to fine art. He was, uh, he was a, you know, just an incredible artist. And he was one you could get past your parents because he was so good that they really had to admit that it wasn't just porn. Right. It was actually fine art. Sure, so, sure. And that's good. I was doing an article for Tales of the Code, and I came across a Wonder Woman comic done in the late 60s that was so porny 
but I started laughing when I was reading it. It's it's it was when Wonder Woman didn't have her powers and she was going around as a karate uh dressed in wow. white. She was a karate lady. Sure. And it's about uh three lesbians who live next door who have a girl with a dog collar around her neck who runs away and runs to Wonder Woman for her to rescue her from her uh from three lesbians. Although they're not called lesbians, they're called them. All the way through the book they're called them. That's wild. But, uh, it's it's just the most bizarre thing. The plot is straight out of a 1960s, 1970s porn novel. And how he got all that past the comics code is beyond me. I mean, yeah. he's got the dog collars that they're supposed to wear around their neck. He's got the girl looking like she's <laughs> underage, the whole book. Oh, brother. It's just That's amazing. Wild. I was reading that going, how in the world did he get this past? And they complained about sweat. What? But, uh, you know, you never can tell. Uh, I, I just think that uh, if you're looking for comics, uh, horror comics, the black and whites are the great place to start, but don't forget that there's a lot of good color uh, comics that had great horror stories in them, too. EC Comics, obviously. But okay. DC, particularly during the late 60s and early 70s, ran an excellent line with some superb art, and they're cheap, and they're being reprinted in black and white, which makes them look ten times better than they did in the original comics. So mm-hmm. if you can get a hold of those showcase presents that have the House of Mystery or House of Secrets in them, you get to see Bernie okay. Wrightson, you get to see Wally Wood, you get to see Al Williamson, all in black and white with great stories. Uh, Marvel did a couple of... Uh, Essential volumes of their horror stuff. The one that has the Son of Satan in it is actually pretty good. Hmm. So those are worth picking up. Um, now we've got a couple minutes left before we uh, run out of time here. I was going to ask you, being uh, such a, an avid fan and collector of comics, on your different trips, excuse me, out to uh, conventions, and do, do you ever run on new talent? And uh, are there any names that you'd like to mention? Um, yeah, occasionally you see something new. Now, it's hard with as many different tiny publishers as are today to, to really get a grasp of everything that's going on. It was much easier back in when I was a kid or starting out because, you know, you had about six to seven publishers and that was it. Uh, and you might find a few, like, small uh, fanzines or something that would put out an issue or two and then they would be gone. And it wasn't mm-hmm. difficult to track down stuff, but there's, like, if you get a Diamonds catalog, there's literally hundreds of publishers out there today. And some of the quality is dreadful, and some of it's pretty good. Uh, I did see one from a, a company called Monsterverse. It was called Bella Lugosi's Grave Tales, and they only have one issue out yet. But it's it's a beautifully done story and art. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cover is done by Basil Gogos, so if you're a, a Warren fan of Famous Monsters, he painted half the covers for Famous Monsters. Cool. And it's a beautiful painting of Bella Lugosi as Dracula. Uh, there's also one called um, Nightmare Alley. There's a three-volume set. by it's, it's all written by one writer called Dirk Manning. And uh, there's three volumes of it, and they're all short stories, eight or nine pages. and But they all build towards a story.